So, practical stuff around diagnosing ADHD, shall we move on to what might actually be useful for you guys instead of talking about the... Hopefully now you've got an idea about what ADHD might look for through the lifespan, and I think that's really, really something which is poorly understood, and I hope everyone's kind of... Um, if you knew that already, then that's fantastic, but if you, um, if you uh, haven't thought about it in the past, I hope you've learned something. So what do I think? I think um, absolutely this is a specialist thing um, all the way through, but the specialist resources aren't going to be available to you. But what I'd like to see is in um, children, the, the, at least the paediatricians and or the psychiatrists having a really careful look. Um, and in adolescents and adults, I'd like to see psychiatrists at least having a shared care arrangement uh, with a GP. Um, Diagnosis of ADHD in children. Look, um, I'm going to say this for you. It's a clinical diagnosis. It's up to the judgment of the of the of the clinicians that are that are interested in this. Um, but what I like to see is a detailed developmental history, including those soft markers of neurological development that I talked about before. I want to see collateral history from multiple sources. I want to see a physical examination and some laboratory testing, some basic stuff to exclude physical illnesses as. And a paediatrician um, will often um, ask for genetic screening for things like fragile X or something else that might cause particularly intelli in an intellectual delay. Um, and then um, as part of making the diagnosis, I think a medication trial is often really, really useful as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, in all of these cases too. And it's about how you set it up. What do I think of, what do I actually think of de detailed developmental history? And I get that this isn't easily doable in primary care by any stretch of the imagination but it's basic milestones, and, and you're looking for um, gross and fine motor milestones as well as language and socialisation, because as we're talking about, we're talking about almost a whole brain dysfunction here. And I want to see a sense, I always ask about a sensory profile, and a sensory profile, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is that everyone's generally speaking a stimulus seeker or a stimulus avoider in one uh, or, or the other, um, or, sorry, in each of the senses. The, my younger child there has blanky, she still has blanky, she's six years old and she's very tactile and, um, and the same blanket was on my older daughter's um, bassinet when she was young but she, bought, she just didn't take to it. Um, and so my younger daughter's a stimulus seeker in the tactile realm, my older daughter is actually a stimulus avoider in the auditory realm, she can't handle sort of so much in the way of loud noises and when she wigs out it's all about shouting for everyone to shut up and going off to her room slamming the door causing a auditory <laughs> more more auditory difficulties so, so my kids have got quite different sensory profiles and I really do think that that whole idea around sensory profile is really really uh, important developing area for neuroatypicality and I think that's a big part of um, if you ask kids with autism kids with Asperger's what um, or ASD or whatever you want to call it um, they will usually have an, uh, an unusual sensory profile. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to know about the person's current language and academic function, and I also want to try and measure um, the comparison of their current function with their academic ability, and I've got some tricks about how to do that, and we're developing a little bit of research around that now. What might diagnosis of ADHD in adolescents look like? Once again, it's a clinical diagnosis. <laughs> Want to see a detailed developmental history, detailed systems inquiry. And so the systems inquiry too should focus on the things that adolescents experience like mood lability and frustration tolerance and more advanced difficulties around attention problems. Um, I want to see an engagement of a family and the whānau in the process as well as collateral history from multiple sources. Um, I want to see the engagement of the other clinicians and we really can't do anything with our Oranga Tamariki in my job and I think that they are a huge resource um, and, that, and that if they are wedded to this process that the outcomes are much, much greater. And, I'll, and I use psychometric and structured interview tools and I'll take you through a structured interview tool in a minute. And once again, part of the diagnosis I often see is the medication trial. It's, I mean, 80 to 90 percent of people um, with ADHD that's uncomplicated by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder respond to stimulants. Um, so if somebody gets a lot better on stimulants and they do it very very quickly often within a week or a few days depending on whether you get the dose right um, then that can be hugely useful in terms of the overall um, um, uh, idea that they may or may not have um, ADHD. And in adults, it's once again a clinical diagnosis, you need a detailed developmental history, collateral history. I think structured interview tools are really important here and that the idea is they map the trait-like symptoms back to childhood and then psychometrics and continuous performance testing probably 
particularly continuous performance testing, has more of a basis here. A continuous performance test is when you have a, a low-key test. Usually it's got two aspects to it. You have to exclude some stimuli, and then you have to respond when other stimuli comes past. It's not easy to do, because what you need to do is fatigue someone's concentration first. And so they're very, very painful to watch. Um, literally they go on for half an hour and somebody's sitting at a computer and they're watching for a certain something to appear on the screen or a certain sound to occur and then they've got another stimuli that they're screening through and you can only really get people to do CPTs once. Um, it's, I think it's um, theoretically much much better than it is practically um, but there's more of a role for CPTs in adults with ADHD. Here's, um, here's something, if you take nothing away from, from else, is, is that this is something called the DIVA. And um, this is a diagnostic interview for ADHD in adults. And I'll um, show you a little bit about it. Here's um, what the DIVA does is it, is, it, is it looks at each of the symptom clusters, asks questions in childhood, asks questions in adulthood, and then looks at the functional stuff that might be um, associated with it. It's free to download. Uh, DivaCenter.eu is the... Um, is, is, the, is the website, this one down here, and note how they spell centre, it's in the American way rather than in the New Zealand way. But, um, but it's a Dutch tool that's been validated in a variety of different languages. And so here's an example of it. Um, what might manifest in childhood as being easily distracted, have difficulty concentrating, needing structure to avoid becoming distracted, may look in an adult as someone who quickly looks bored with things, finds it difficult to watch a film through to the end or to read a book, or is quickly distracted by their own thoughts or associations. Um, um, what might uh, avoiding tasks that require sustained mental effort look like? Well, it, in childhood it might be reading few books or does not feel like reading due to the mental effort or just avoidance of tasks that require a lot of concentration, whereas an adult might hate monotonous work such as administration or postponed tasks or do, the, or do the easiest or the nicest things first of all. This is me getting medical students disease again. Um, it, this is all of us to some extent too, but this is an often thing and this is functionally impairing. So it's the extent of it that you've got to be very, very careful about. Um, let's look at hyperactivity and impulsivity uh, number four. What would it be like to difficult to engage in leisure activities quietly in childhood that might be unable to watch TV or films quietly or being asked to be quieter or calm down all the time, whereas in adults it might be being loud in all kinds of situations, being too cocky, um, difficult to do activities quietly or difficulty in speaking um, softly. And uh, a waiting turn uh, and difficulty might be always needing, in childhood sorry, might be always needing to be the first to talk or act and difficulty waiting turn in group activities, whereas um, in adulthood it might be problems with waiting in a queue or difficulties waiting your turn during conversation or just generally being impatient and needing to do things. And so that's, that's how kind of the diva works and I think it's a really, really useful tool. Um, if you want to do some other reading, CADRA's got some really interesting resources on and that's got a functional assessment tool as well. And if you want to, and, um, and of course, where there's any uh, diagnosis that requires complexity and treatment, NICE um, has published something as well, which is, which is hugely useful. Both CADRA and NICE talk about first line uh, treatment being with stimulants because they're most likely to work quickly and they're, and they're most likely to work full stop. Just some pointers for the treatment of ADHD. I can see everyone's kind of probably could do with some stimulants right about now, mm -hmm. perhaps coffee. Um, <clears throat> um, the, probably before initiating treatment, it's important to do a um, to, to think about the sorts of things that stimulants might kill you with, and it generally is around seizures and around sudden cardiac death or prolonged QTC, something like that. So if you've got a history of either of those things, you should probably investigate them more um, uh, uh, quickly before initiating treatment. And then you need um, pre and post cardiovascular OBS and height and, um, oh, sorry, height if appropriate, if somebody's still growing, um, weight otherwise, and you may or may not um, consider a pre and post ECG. But look, Ritalin, um, methylphenidate, stimulants, whatever, they're the, probably the most studied medication in the world because as you can imagine, the risks of giving them to <coughs> school aged children and is quite great and the optics if something goes wrong are, are disastrous. Um, 
What do I do when I'm treating is that I have an initial treatment trial period and I say to them, look, I'm going to give this to you and we'll reassess after four to six weeks. That's if we've got four to six weeks to work with, we often don't. Um, the minimum I say is three weeks and that allows me to prescribe the medication, see the person twice for follow-up um, and change either the formulation or the dose so that we get the treatment right before they go. Um, I always use stimulus treatment, uh, confirmed diagnosis, 70% of people with more complicated neurodevelopmental abnormalities respond to, um, to ADHD medication, uh, so that's things like fetal alcohol spectrum disorder being associated with, um, with ADHD, whereas 90% of people with uncomplicated ADHD tend to respond as well. Um, I use long-acting formulations, um, Concerta is probably the longest acting that we know at 10 to 12 hours, Ritalin LA is about 8 to 10 hours and Ritalin MR is about um, 6 to 8 hours but these are theoretical and how these medications are released into the system and then processed by the liver actually um, is incredibly uh, different um, amongst all, uh, between people and I'd be um, Neglectful not to say that Ritalin LA is, uh, and Ritalin MR are cheaper than uh, Concerta, given the uh, fact that we're in the Pharmax building. Um, but um, um, they're all good medications and they should all work. I probably find that Ritalin LA and Ritalin MR are the best tolerated as well. I used to routinely start with Concerta, now I just go to start with Ritalin LA most of the time. And then I will do a weekly review and I'll consider both the dose of the medication and the formulation of the medication. And if somebody is still having trouble getting to sleep at night and you don't think it's a dose related issue, you go for the shorter acting, um, you move it back to the shorter acting ones. The other thing I use a lot of is melatonin and melatonin is really, really useful for the dark. Um, sadly it costs about a dollar a tablet for the immediate release version. You can get in, in neurodevelopmental abnormalities, you can get funded slow release melatonin, but slow release melatonin to me doesn't make any sense. What you're wanting to do is support the circadian rhythm. You're not wanting somebody on night shift to sleep through the day. <laughs> um, um, but, um, but I use melatonin a lot. In, all forms of neurodevelopmental abnormality and I think it's generally accepted that people um, people who are neurodevelopmentally abnormal don't develop tolerance and side effects to, to melatonin whereas um, those with that those with neurodevelopment yeah those without neurodevelopmental disorders you might use it in a course basis those with neurodevelopmental disorders you might use it regularly yeah what, what do you use? three to six Yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't. Three to six. Three to six. Even the little, little um, <clears throat> I'm about? almost ashamed to say this, but my daughter takes 1.5. It seems to work really, really well on her. But I'm, I'm treating um, people that have often got um, 20 kilos of weight on me. So if you're talking about young, five young kids, you're talking one, to one milligram, one to one and a half. Yep, yep, okay. yep. Sorry, so I'm ta use, talking so about. We use the circadian um, slow release, but tell the parents to crush it. Yeah. Right. And it becomes more immediate. And, yeah, that's... And then often the kids that don't like swallowing... And it's... It's actually quite the depression anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Thank you for mentioning that. That's, that um, and it's funded that yeah, way too. No, Other, otherwise, it's a, otherwise it's a dollar a tablet, which is, um, mm. which is great when Oranga Tamariki is paying, but... Um, <laughs> um, and look, I, I think it's really important... Um, that if you're gonna, so, so then you move on to a phase once you've trialed the Ritalin of ongoing treatment and what that's gonna look like. And, um, and so I will talk to people about the formulation of the medication, how regularly they want to take it. If they wanna have the weekends off, then that's fine. They just need to tell me they're gonna have the weekends off and I'll build that in. Um, it's important to come to an agreement about the target symptoms that somebody's experiencing and I guess they can become particularly pertinent if they stop their medication, those symptoms re-emerge. And like I said, we're not often talking about hyperactivity in, in the populations that I'm dealing with. We're often talking about frustration tolerance, mood lability and, uh, and motivation to work really as much as anything else. Um, we talk about how we're going to measure the symptoms um, <clears throat> and we talk about the period of treatment that we're initially agreeing to. Um, I think it's also important to realise that um, we're talking a lot about medications here and the best outcomes occur with ADHD in association with some kind of psychological treatment. Um, there is a six to eight course CBT um, program for ADHD and ideally I'd love that to be available for everyone but practically speaking it's not. But of course there's all sorts of self-help books around ADHD that are perfectly, um, perfectly um, cheap and accessible for everyone and they're very easy to get hold of 
um, this um, this one here is written by Charles, uh, Russell Barclay, who's um, one of the early writers of ADHD, along with um, Biederman and uh, and Connors and those guys, and uh, out of the states. Um, and this one's your CBT handbook for ADHD as well, and that's incredibly useful as well. People should be able to do that themselves, and I think it's perfectly okay for you to say, hey, look, we're only giving you this medication if you're also doing other things to assist yourself. You need to come back and show me some notes you might have made and some changes you might have made in your life that will support this treatment, because the medication by itself will do something, but it won't do the whole lot for you. Now it's time for you to learn, your, learn the skills that you would have learned if you hadn't have had ADHD. If you're prescribing stimulants, you need to do months, six ob sorry, six monthly obs, including weight. And if somebody's growing, it's important to monitor their height. You need to think about the formulation and the dose. One of the things that I do if somebody's in the community, which they're not often when I'm prescribing, but I will sometimes do it, is you look at the dispensing period. And if they're coming to you after 37 days and their last script was given out 28 days ago, you have a conversation about why that's the case. Uh, and if they say, look, I'm not taking it Sundays, well, you need to tell me that you're not taking it Sundays because I'm giving you 28 days for, and I want to see you in 28 days' time. For the and of course, you don't say that up front, um, but that's a way in which you can monitor it, and I think that's a really, really useful thing to do. Um, we've got, <coughs> people curse computers all the time, but in ADHD, we've actually got a really reasonable um, um, database that holds lab, lab information, um, dispensing information for most pharmacies and also all secondary medical contacts like clinic letters and emergency department things and stuff like that and we can all use that just to monitor it and I urge people to to, to think carefully about that. Um, I prescribe once or twice weekly. Um, I think that if you're going to divert the medication um, going to the pharmacy once a week when you've still got your active ADHD is much much harder than just getting three months at a time and then selling it straight to the mongrel mob uh, and coming back later so I'll often try and involve the um, the pharmacy in that and I'll ring them and say sorry about this they hate it I'm going to do weekly dispensing but um, these are the reasons and um, they'll often and sometimes the pharmacies will ring me and they'll say this person's a day late or two days late or something like that and then that prompts a whole bunch of other conversations and I'd love drug testing in the community to be available. Um, you can do all sorts of drug testing on inpatients, but you can't do them on outpatients um, for free. Um, but uh, And of course, you, there's two reasons you drug test. One is to make sure they're taking their amphetamines, and the other is to look for other drugs of abuse, such as cannabis or um, um, other kinds of amphetamines. And if there are other drugs on the test, would you continue to prescribe? Or is it, uh, it leads to a tough conversation, really, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, if somebody's showing signs of cannabis use, for example, they're probably using quite chronically. It's not often a one off use of cannabis will show up significantly in the urine. Um, and it certainly won't if you're asked to do it again a week later. Um, so if there's chronic substance use, then I think that's very much a contraindication. Yeah. And part of the reason we worry about this is because the. Um, uh, amphetamine structure is very closely related to the methamphetamine structure, but um, my, my knowledge of organic chemistry is probably not great these days, but I believe that these CH3 groups here, they mean that um, the methamphetamine can be vaporised a lot easier without the, the, the main structure being broken down. That converts it into smoke, smoke's inhaled into the lungs, it gets into the bloodstream very quickly, crosses the blood-brain barrier very quickly, so the monoamine release that it causes is much, much greater, whereas this uh, this guy here, you can't burn him. Um, he, uh, if you if you try and set him on fire, um, the whole chemical structure falls apart, and you just wind up with um, water and uh, carbon um, monoxide and dioxide. So um, <laughs> that's why methamphetamine is, is is much much more potent because it can be taken in a way which is a lot um, um, faster absorbed. What you can do with amphetamine, of course, is inject it, but um, um, <clears throat> it's also Amphetamine's less stable in water, just like it is uh, with heat, than, than what methamphetamine is as well. So do they smoke the, like, the, do they, do they smoke the methylphenidate? Do they smoke the methamphetamine? Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Not methylphenidate. Not methylphenidate. Right. Or amphetamine or dexamphetamine is the other one that's, um, yeah. They, they can't do that because they, this, the whole thing kind of blows up. But that's 
part of the reason why everyone's kind of worried about it. Just want to talk a little bit about the effects that stimulants have. One of the primary effects of stimulants is actually on the cardiovascular system, and so it uh, increases your heart rate a little bit and uh, your cardiac output by increasing both your blood pressure and your heart rate. Um, and so um, an important part of it is peripheral cardiovascular effects. What that does is that allows the blood to get to your brain more easily, and then when it's time to recruit parts of your brain to do some work, um, that the blood will get in there and provide it with energy much, much faster. Um, it also has a central neurosystem effect too on monoamine release, and this is what I was talking about before, and the monoamines, the big ones are serotonin, noradrenaline and dopamine. Um, with methamphetamine, when you smoke it, you get a massive dopamine release, and then that's what the addictive part of it is. But if you don't flood the, um, the brain with um, stimulant medication, what happens is that is it's the noradrenaline and the serotonin that are much, much more likely to be active rather than the dopamine. Um, which is why it doesn't have an uh, intoxicating and addictive effect to it. Sorry, can you say that again? Mm. When you flood the brain with methamphetamine, or, or with uh, high doses of any amphetamine, it'll release everything, including dopamine in great amounts. When you drop it in slowly, the primary release happens to be on these other molecules, the serotonin and the noradrenaline, rather than the dopamine. And it's the dopamine release that gives you the sense of getting intoxicated. Um, or Sorry, the sense of satisfaction associated with getting intoxicated. People will notice a rush too, and that's much, much more around adrenaline and uh, noradrenaline release. But, um, but the addictive part of any drug of abuse is the sudden dopamine release. Do they get that with a, if they Yeah, the only, the only way you can really um, abuse long-acting methylphenidate is to break the capsules open, to crush it up and to snort it, and then that does horrible things to your nose. That's the only way you can really get it into the bloodstream quickly enough to get a, to get a rush out of it. Um, if you take too much um, um, methylphenidate, it's actually, most people tell me it's really unpleasant. They just feel incredibly anxious because they've got so much noradrenaline charging around their system. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's, and the cardiovascular effects are much, much more prominent as well. So they've got this racing heart and, this, and, and all of these symptoms that are parasympathetic in origin and much, much, sorry, sympathetic in origin are much, much more likely to cause people to feel like they're stressed and nervous and stuff like that. So that means it's less likely to be diverted? Correct. Yeah. Then, well, de de yeah, they can all be diverted, but you need to chemically alter them to get them into a state of methamphetamine. Um, and you and that's quite a process. Lots and lots of non-stimulants are available and theoretically available. And as we just saw, we were talking about the monoamines um, here, the serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine. So none of these will be surprises to you. Um, there's a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor or something that purports to be a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor, which is called atomoxetine or Stratera. It's expensive. It takes eight or so weeks to come on because it works via stopping the, the, the transporter from mopping up the, the noradrenaline in the brain, much, much like an antidepressant does with serotonin. Um, and I don't think it's that well tolerated, so I don't tend to use a whole lot of atomoxetine. Um, SSRIs can be used in ADHD, and I guess predominantly citalopram. Um, I was just at EFCAP, as I said the other way, and some Danish guy has done some really amazing study um, looking at regression analysis of all of these factors associated with teenage criminality, and he found a couple of things. One is that um, ADHD, even if it's treated and once you control for treatment and stimulants and stuff like that, still 1.6 times more likely to offend somebody with ADHD than somebody without once you've accounted for the treatment on and treatment off. The other thing he noticed is that um, is that there was a similar um, rate, sorry, similar rate of improvement in offending rates with citalopram as there was with stimulants. Um, and if you think about it, the citalopram will nicely treat the mood lability and the frustration tolerance um, quite well, which is often some of the cardinal symptoms that you're looking at. So feel free to give people with ADHD citalopram, but you need to explain to them that it's an off-label use um, as well and that there are other side effects associated with it. Um, there is some theoretical um, idea that venlafaxine can be useful and what I've noticed clinically is that people who are depressed, particularly with melancholic depression, 
really don't like venlafaxine because it makes them feel restless and horrible and, and herky-jerky. Um, but people who um, do have ADHD tend to tolerate venlafaxine much, much better and it works quite well. And it take, the problem is it just takes three to four weeks to come on. Um, so I think that's um, potentially something which we need to do more research on and I think that's something which theoretically works. Um, bupropion is something, um, Zyban is used for smoking cessation. Um, but that's something which is st um, structurally related um, to amphetamines in terms of its um, basic biochemical layout. Bupropion also works by um, <clears throat> um, the dopamine release mechanism. So, um, so that's one of the monoamines that you look for. It's essentially a dopamine and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Uh, that's why it's classified as an atypical antidepressant because it doesn't work on serotonin. And so that theoretically can be useful, and I know some people that have treated people with ADHD that they haven't wanted to give stimulants to that Bupropion has worked on. And I've got a great story about Amipramine. I tried it once in the prison with a young person, and I looked it up what the dose should be, and it was 150 milligrams, but of course Amipramine's a very old medication. It only comes in 10 milligram tablets, so the poor kid had to take 15 um, tablets every night. And, uh, and as you can imagine, the patient compliance with that wasn't very high after a while. Um, but in theory, I think a mix of bupropion and citalopram or uh, venlafaxine uh, and, um, um, by itself, which is a mix, you can work on multiple monoamine systems all at once. Anyone have any questions about those? No. No, that's what I was just going to say, the whole suicidality. <laughs> the whole suicidality thing, yeah. Many of these medications yep. are really touchy about the yep. GPs for yep. good reasons. Yep, I yep. Hey, look. Take on all of that. And, and look, I've tried imipramine once, um, and, it, and it didn't work. Um, yeah, yeah. But look, um, I, I think there is a role for sertraline and fluoxetine if, if you want to try that instead, um, if they haven't got black box labels, warnings. Yeah. If you've got a young person who's had suicidality as part of their um, complex, which often yes. happens with these kids, are you still okay about giving medications with a high risk? Or like, these what? are the questions we face yeah, in general I, 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 I absolutely am. I think it's a terrible tragedy that the misinformation yeah. that mm. um, has. So I don't, 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 so we do think the SSRIs cause suicidality, but they also treat depression. And yeah. so I think that, there's the, that the drug companies have done us a great disservice and stopped people treating um, depression, anxiety, ADHD. Um, there's a great avoidance of using the medications. It's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I'd say the same thing for you know, treating maternal depression. Um, yeah. I think that we've really stepped away from using medications when they're needed. And I think that's the important thing, is if somebody has depression, then they often have suicidality and they need treatment. If you've got concern that they've got suicidality because of something like an SSRI, would you still feel okay about heading towards um, yeah, I, Ritalin? I, so like I going to completely different classes? Uh, uh, still might have I always consent, explain it to people, explain it really carefully. Yep. The suicidality tends to be in the first week or the first 10 yep. days. Mm. It's a phase that tends to pass. Um, I've only seen one person ever that I thought made it seriously mm. worse. Yeah, and, and a lot of that's to do with the akathisia associated with it, so yeah. people get intensely anxious and, they, and it's an, almost an immediate reaction and what I say when I'm prescribing is that you take one dose and if you notice this immediate reaction, you take another dose and if it's still there, just call me. Um, the other thing I'll do is if somebody's really melancholically depressed and or psychotic and you want to start them on an SSRI for, for treatment, which is what you should be doing, you can always cover them with a benzo, a long-acting benzo in particular, for that, for that period if you think that things are going to be worse. Um, I know that we're also trained not to use benzos, but in fact they're incredibly safe and incredibly effective. And um, and um, there's certainly a role for something like clonazepam or something like that in, in this situation. This is huge in Canterbury. We've got traumatised kids, dysfunctional mm -hmm. populations to some degree as well. Mm -hmm. Presentations are quite different. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah. What's safe and what's not safe? Is yep. Really and look, if you're talking about trauma, I think uh, alpha blockade is really useful, particularly if there's a if there's a um, sleep problem and if there's an adrenal aspect of the sleep problem or a cortisol poor, um, poor sleep. So the idea when you go to sleep and you wake up kind of anxious and, and worried and it takes a long time to settle down and get back to sleep, I think alpha blockade can be really, really useful for that. So that's prazosin. Okay. Um, 
lowers blood pressure, so don't tell them to jump out of the bed in the middle of the night and go to the toilet. Um, they just need to take that a little bit um, more slowly than what they would otherwise. But I think that's grossly underused um, in, in complex trauma populations or, or people that are just on edge and they can't sleep. <coughs> what would ADHD in the ideal healthcare delivery look like? Well, I would like to see a um, shared care model Specialist input for the diagnosis. I'd like to see the specialist input for the period of treatment when you're first that first four to six weeks that we're talking about and The specialist then along with allied health professionals would be responsible for making up a treatment contract Which involves some kind of extra work around ADHD either CBT or self-help or something like that So that this is attacked from a whole bunch of different perspectives and also the treatment is more likely to work um, Ongoing treatment could be via a shared care arrangement, but I'd still like to see annual six monthly follow up um, um, in support for, for prescribers by specialist services if that was what was going to happen. Um, <clears throat> everyone's kind of sitting there probably um, chortling back laughter thinking what kind of crazy environment is this, but there's not a lot of resources out there at the moment, and, um, but that's ultimately what I'd like to see. Um, like I said, psychological input, uh, four to six CBT sessions plus annual um, refreshes and drug testing. And, um, but at the moment, the reality is we've got a lack of skills, we've got a lack of awareness, and therefore often falls to primary practitioners like, um, like many of you are here. <coughs> and, um, and so I would recommend um, shorter than normal uh, intervals for pickup of medication, monitoring the um, prescription intervals very, very carefully to make sure a person's using the medication as they say they're going to use it, and um, uh, using uh, basic self-help literature to assist. Now, everyone's done incredibly well, and it looks like we've all been on exercise bikes in here, judging by the looks of the window at the back. Um, so steamed up and foggy that it is. Um, if anyone's interested in just quickly whizzing through some prison data, I can, but essentially what I'm going to say is that ADHD is a great way of, um, sorry, prison's a great way of gathering all of those people with ADHD together because they've got genetic predisposition and socioeconomic disadvantage and a long history of poor function and a bunch of comorbidities that are worrying like mood and impulse control and frustration tolerance. There's mood there. Overreaction to perceived slights, which is what often happens when people get frustrated. And then you've got impulsivity and substance use. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty potent combination for offending. Um, um, <clears throat> the actual prevalence of ADHD depends uh, on a variety of different things, including um, the country in which they are and the rates of incarceration, the setting and the security, and the method of diagnosis and the definition of ADHD. And if you can imagine, putting a pris this in front of a prisoner, this is the ASRS or the adult self-report scale, um, with its highlighted box and you say to the prisoner, hey, if you get enough of those grey boxes, we'll give you some Ritalin. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that's kind of a massive uh, disaster in and of itself. And like I've been trying to emphasise, you want to see information from multiple sources, you want to see people using structured interview tools and standardised ratings files to make the definition. And there's very few, um, there's not many um, <clears throat> studies around uh, that, that have done this. Um, but probably the best ones in New South Wales and Australia and um, that 35% of people screened positive for ADHD and upon structured interview 17% of them were thought to um, have ADHD. So that's um, kind of obviously it's overrepresented. And um, then studies with similar methodologies see positive screens in um, somewhere between one quarter and almost two thirds of prisoners and the ADHD is confirmed somewhere between um, 14 and 40 percent of the time. The 62 figure and the 40 figure both relate to the same study and that was maximum security in Sweden. Um, and um, this is what they found when they treated people. Oh sorry I'm just going to flash up. Youth obviously is a big big one as well including 45 percent of male youth offenders, youth in Illinois 22 percent. Um, <coughs> But the, um, and Susie Young did a big meta-analysis and she's really wonderful to, um, there's some YouTube videos of her lecturing too and she's a really smart um, forensic psychologist in the UK who's very good to listen to. Um, does treatment help with prisoners? Um, it does at a population level. They took a huge Swedish database and they looked at people with ADHD judging by their, um, their prescriptions 
and whether they were on stimulants or not, and they worked out from the dispensing details whether they were on or off their medication, and they found out that um, the rates of offending increased markedly with ADHD present, and the rates of offending, so, so people with ADHD were much more likely to offend, um, about three times more likely, depending on um, whether you were male, or seven times more likely if you were female, and that um, out of those male offenders with ADHD, um, they were about 50% um, um, more likely to offend, or 25%, or depending on whether you were male or female as well. And then at an individual level, um, a Swedish uh, maximum security um, uh, prison um, found this, and that is a marked decline in the uh, Connors Observer Rating Scale in maximum security prisoners. The, the, the um, blue line, the solid blue line is the people that started methylphenidate straight away. The dashed line is those who had a placebo for five weeks before they started methylphenidate. And as you can see, they're fairly closely mirrored and a mark, uh, uh, an absolutely marked improvement. Such too, such that um, people, the number needed to treat, which is kind of a magical sign of, of, of um, how many people you need to treat to get a benefit from it is 1.1. Um, which is which is just amazing. So as you can imagine, um, I'm fairly passionate about the treatment of prisoners, um, and I'm passionate about the treatment of ADHD. So this forms a nice intersection. And then just lastly to say that um, the, there's something called the UK Adult ADHD Network, and that's shared information essentially between health services, um, prisons, and, and youth justice facilities, courts, police stations, um, and actually police when they're apprehending people for various crimes as well and that they've worked hard to make sure that they've got much much better access to the to, to ADHD treatment and medications than what they otherwise would have and um, and it's a fairly um, it's 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 streets ahead of what anyone else in the world has got essentially so that's you've been a very attentive audience and I'm very grateful um, for the intelligent questions that have been asked and also for sitting through and listening to me. You've done well. Um, we're on time. Um, more than happy to field some questions, but you can also come up and ask me sort of personally. I, the slides are going to be available. Um, sadly, I'm going to be um, on video for the rest of my life. It's posted somewhere in some <laughs> corner of the internet where people go to laugh and <laughs> downvote. But I hope this has been useful and I hope that I've covered the idea of how ADHD changes over the lifespan and given you some brief treatment tips in the hope that, um, that we get more awareness uh, of this.